Hello and welcome to this video on Citation Basics for MLA 8th edition. My name is Adam Griggs and I am a Research Services Librarian at Mercer University Library. Now this video is really meant as an introduction into the MLA format, so let's go ahead and jump right in. I do think it is important to talk a little bit about the guiding principles behind the MLA 8th edition. This is because the Modern Language Association is really making an effort to simplify the citation process and to make it more intuitive. And these principles that we're going to discuss come right out of the MLA handbook. So the first principle is to cite simple traits shared by most works. What this means is that most of the things that we're going to be citing honestly share a certain number of elements in common, regardless of their formats. In practice, this means that there are no longer distinctions between web and print formats. So the second principle is to remember that there is often more than one correct way to document a source. I hear this from students all the time. They want to know if they've done the citation the right way. So there are many situations where doing a citation is pretty straightforward, but at other times there can be multiple right ways. Finally, the third principle says, make your documentation useful to readers. Citation is all about making it so your readers can find the resources and works that you are writing about. In that regard, make sure to actually cite the version of the work that you are using. So what are the elements of an MLA citation? Well, there are nine, and they're pretty straightforward. So there's author, title of source, title of container, which we'll talk about in detail, other contributors, version, number, publisher, publication date, and location. Now, I want to draw your attention to the punctuation that you see after each of the elements. So if you look at author, title of source, and location, you'll notice that those are the only ones that end in a period. For everything else, though, you use a comma in between. This really simplifies the punctuation for the entire citation. Now, just because a certain element has a name in the MLA style does not mean we won't at times call it something else. So, for example, the author could be the creator, the artist, the director of the film, an editor, or an uploader of a video. The title of the source could include the title of the book, an article, a chapter, or an episode in a TV show. Now, the containers are what contain the smaller work. And so this could include things like academic journals, newspapers, databases, television shows. Other contributors can include people like translators, editors, compilers, actors. Um, before we talked that, we want to actually be citing the version of the work that we're using. So here we would indicate whether it was the expanded edition, second edition, or, for example, a director's cut DVD. Now, the number is really useful for periodicals, and here's where we would indicate the volume number and the issue number of the work that we're using. The publisher could be the academic press where it was published. It could be the website. It could be a production company of a film. The publication date can be a few different things. So it could be a posting date. It could be the air date. It could be the actual date that it was published in the journal. And then finally, for location, this is where you would put your page numbers. If it's a web resource, you would use a DOI or URL, the DOI preferred. And then here you could also indicate a physical location if, for example, you're citing an artwork in a museum. And I hear this question from students a lot. They say, what do I do if an element is missing? Well, the answer is actually very simple. You skip it. You only need to cite the elements that are present in the resource that you are using. Now, let's actually turn to some citation examples. So here's an example of a book. It's called The Origins of Human Communication by Michael Tomasello. So what we'll do is we'll put up our elements in the MLA citation, and then we will look through the bibliographic information and import only the ones that are needed for the citation. So in this case, it's the author, the title of the source, the publisher, and the publication date. And then because we have all the punctuation set out in the actual elements themselves, we just need to string it all together and then we have our MLA citation. Now I do want to point out that it is always last name before the first name when we write the author's name. Let's look at another common example. So this one is an essay in a book and the essay is called The Love of God and Affliction by Simone Weil. Now you'll notice that this one has a number of different elements than the previous one. So we put up our list of elements and then we just have to start filling in. So we have Ve, comma, Simone for the author. The title of the source is The Love of God and Affliction. Now you notice that this one actually has a container. So a container is the larger work that the smaller work is contained within. Right? So this one is called Waiting for God. And then we have another con contributor. This one has a translator. So we say translated by Emma Crawford. I'm going to put in the publisher, the publication date and the location. So in this case, the location is just the page numbers where the essay is located within the book. 
So we just have to string it all together after it's all written out, like in the previous example, and there is our MLA citation. For our third example, let's look at an academic journal article. So here we have an article called A New Proof of Euclid's Theorem, which was published in the American Mathematical Monthly. So we put up our MLA elements, and we import the ones that are present. And you'll notice it's a different mix. So the author, Sidek Philip, uh, title of the source, A New Proof of Euclid's Theorem. The title of the container is the journal name, so the American Mathematical Monthly. And because it's a periodical, we need to indicate the number, so volume 113, number 10. Publication date is December 20, 2006, and then the location is page 937 to 938. Again, just put it all together, and we have our journal citation. Up to now, all the examples that we've looked at have been pretty simple. They've only had one container or sometimes zero containers. But MLA recognizes that sometimes there's a need for multiple containers. And this throws students off sometimes. And so they'll ask, you know, why do I need multiple containers? Um, and actually, it's pretty common. So you encounter it quite a bit. So I have a few examples here. So for example, if you're doing a chapter in a book within an anthology, Right? So if you have a book in an anthology, but you just need a certain chapter of it, the title of the work will be the title of the chapter, the container one will be the actual book itself, and then the container two will be the anthology. Right? So it could also happen if we just want to use a, a little part of a work. So for example, if we have a graph in an article published by a journal. So the graph will be the title of the work in the citation, and then the first container will be the article that the graph is found in, and then the second container will be the journal that the graph or that the article is published in. And finally, uh, MLA also wants you to actually indicate how it is you access the article. And so a lot of times you'll find academic resources through a database. So here we have an article published by a journal accessed in a database. Here, the title of the article will be the title of the work in your citation. The first container will be the journal where the article is published. And then the second container will be the database uh, where you access the journal. Now, how does having multiple containers impact the overall citation format? Well, the answer is not a whole lot. We follow pretty much the same formula. So here we have an MLA practice template, which you can find at style.mla.org. And you'll notice we have the author and the title of the source at the top, but then we have two containers underneath it. So we always start with the smaller container first and then move out to the larger container. And we are essentially just repeating elements three through nine. And remember, you only have to put in those elements that are present in the resource itself. So once you input all that information, you just have to string it all together to get your citation. Now, just because the MLA practice template only has two containers, you are not necessarily limited to two containers. You could theoretically have as many containers as you need. Um, and so here's a pretty common example, which is just one that's expanded on from the previous slide. So we have a graph in an article published by a journal access in a database. So in this example, the graph would be the title of the work, the article would be the first container, the journal would be the second container, and the database would be the third container. Okay, now let's look at a citation example that would require more than one container. So here we have a journal article from a database, and this article was found in the database JSTOR. Now remember, we just have to start with the author and the title of the source, and then we repeat elements three through nine, first for container one, and then for container two. Now, remember that container one is also the smaller container, and container two is the larger container. So let's input that information and see what we get. So here we have the author, which is Williams, Bernard, and then the title of the source, which is Philosophy as a Humanistic Discipline. And then the title of container one is just the name of the journal where the original article was published. So in this case, the journal is called Philosophy, and then we input the number, publication date, and then the location of the article within the journal, so the page numbers. And then container two just contains the information about the database. So here we have JSTOR, which we've italicized. And then the only other information we need is the location. Where did we find it? And in this case, it's a URL. So we put that information in, we string it all together, and there's our MLA citation. Now, we cannot go over every example that you will encounter, so if you need some extra help, there are a number of other places you can go. So the first one is to ask a librarian. 
So you can come talk to us in person at Mercer University Library, or you can chat us online, you can email us, you can even call us. And you can find our contact information at libraries.mercer.edu. Another place you can turn is the MLA Handbook, the 8th edition. We have a number of these in the library. They're pretty thin volumes, but they're very accessible, and they have tons of examples. Uh, finally, there are quite a few online helps out there, a lot of resources on MLA Citation, and I just want to highlight two of them. The first is the MLA Style Center. So you can find practice templates here, they have examples, and you can even ask questions of their official MLA experts. And secondly, uh, out of Purdue University, they have an online writing center, which you can find at owl.purdue.edu. So they do a great job with many citation styles, not just MLA, but they have quite a few examples that are really helpful. Now that's all I have for this video on Citation Basics. Um, thanks for watching and please reach out if you have any questions.